perhaps it's uh, time to begin. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker in our career talk series today. So Alexei Gordon. Uh, Alexei is the adjunct professor in the School of Mathematics and Statistics here at Carleton University. And uh, he has uh, a rare combination of skills uh, where he is an expert uh, in uh, software, in computer programming, but also in uh, computer hardware, and uh, at the same time in applied mathematics. And uh, so, uh, so Alexei is a veteran of Ottawa high-tech industry. So he has been uh, a consultant for uh, innumerable number of uh, companies uh, here. So, and uh, I, so basically, so when a company has uh, a project that uh, is uh, struggling and uh, to make uh, this project a su success, uh, so Alexei Godin is the person whom they, they will call. Uh, all right, so today Alexei will uh, tell us about high-tech landscape uh, in Ottawa. So please, Alexei. Thank you. Well, I'm almost start blushing. So like after this introduction, so um, so like uh, today, uh, today conversation would look like this. Uh, so um, I will tell a lot of things which should have a prefix like from my point of view, because compared to the real mathematics, uh, the certain things are very hard to prove. And maybe some people see those things differently. So well, uh, feel free to ask any questions, and I even ready to change change some uh, points uh, based on your feedback. So, because it is it is very much relative. So, like what what I'm talking about. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. Screen number one. Um, you see. Uh, I hope you see my presentation. So, like, um, I will I will slowly go through these um, through these slides, and I will maybe make a few excursions sideways from from this main line. So, uh, okay. So today we will talk uh, basically. Uh, about the possibility for the math and stat students and also engineering students to find a job. Uh, it could be a co-op position, it could be a summer job. So basically where to look for and what is good and what is bad and what is acceptable and what it might be not quite acceptable. So like uh, uh, in this presentation, I will review what we have here in Ottawa, and I will probably go a little bit far away because a new post-COVID uh, paradigm is allow a lot of uh, online uh, or combinational part of the job. We will talk about that, okay? So uh, uh, we will talk about uh, where and how to find a job, how to estimate how good or how bad the job you find out, and how to behave yourself during the interview, what kind of skills could be useful. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> a little bit of math, yeah, okay. And I would be happy to answer some of your questions. Okay, so first of all, as you probably know, not very large city of Ottawa is a home of the huge number of the high-tech companies. And like I steal this picture from, uh, from the website, the link you see below, which has a full list of the companies um, are physically located in Ottawa. And this, uh, this list is surprisingly huge. So like you, you will see over 200 different companies. So there are actually a lot um, organization you could search uh, for the position during the summertime or during the call. Uh, most of these companies uh, located either at the West End or um, on the other side river in Gatineau. 
So um, this, uh, this strange separation is built uh, on a specific economical stimulus, which Quebec has uh, done slightly better than Ontario. So like that's how it works. Okay, uh, there is also a fairly big cluster of the uh, high-tech companies around the Ottawa airport. We will talk about that too. Um, so, according, uh, by books, National Capital Region, which is called NCR, has over 15,000 companies. Well, to be honest, uh, the probably the real amount uh, should be divided by two. So like it's, uh, it's about 8,000 companies are actually um, actively working and they might be your potential target. So uh, historically, a lot of math students looking uh, for, the, uh, for the job in the financial companies. So unfortunately, this is not exist. It's not in Ottawa. So like I know a couple of financial companies here in Ottawa, but they are small and they usually branches of other companies uh, from Montreal and from Toronto. So like if you're looking for the job in finance, Ottawa is not a place uh, to look um, for. So like you, uh, for good or for bad, you have to move either to Toronto or to, to Montreal. Okay, so, but the second uh, position is presented uh, amazingly. So uh, most of the companies in Ottawa covered by the definition of, uh, of what's called telecom. Some people um, like to call them IT companies just between you and me. So like, don't tell that uh, to, uh, to your hiring manager, people usually don't like this name. So like a telecom company usually providing services, making equipment uh, and software to make all kinds of uh, telecommunication things. It's from the parts which is probably uh, pr previously belonged to Nortel, to many other companies like Cisco, Juniper, uh, which making actively telecommunication equipment. Uh, another position which is fairly strong is the government. Uh, yeah, I know there is a perception that the government job is kind of tedious and boring and so on so far. However, um, I would say uh, two serious organization like Department of National Defense and uh, Canada Security Establishment um, are constantly looking for the smart people and they have a very interesting job. They don't like to talk loud and publicly about what exactly they're doing, but definitely mm, these, uh, these organizations are looking for the smart and educated people. Um, I will jump a little bit forward just for your information. Those organizations will require what's called security clearance. Uh, I will, I will stay, uh, I will uh, not say any more words about that. If somebody has a question about that, ask me later on, uh, at least like I did not plan to talk about that. There is absolutely nothing wrong about the security clearance. And I would say if you at least theoretically consider this, uh, this, uh, this kind of employment uh, for the Canadian uh, and Ontario government, so like it's better to uh, set up this clearance uh, in advance because it takes some time. It's not a big deal, but it takes time just because it's a specific government procedure. Uh, fairly recently, we start to get uh, actually amazing opportunity, which we often call robotics, but actually it's self-driving cars. So like we get a bunch of startup companies and these startup companies uh, working uh, with, a, uh, with, a, with a, in a different areas of self-driving car, everything from uh, self-driving taxi, 
to self-driving agriculture equipment because, um, and from my point of view, self-driving agriculture equipment is a much better area, especially for Canada, because um, rural uh, regions are constantly lacking of uh, uh, young and strong people who could work, uh, who could make it, made a job with them with agriculture equipment. So like self-driving uh, agriculture equipment might be a great solution for Canada in general to, uh, to fight all these deficiency and to improve the quality of agricultural living. So uh, the, another area, it's kind of getting start to get smaller. It's a medical and wellness equipment. Uh, uh, there are a bunch of uh, general service companies. These companies are often called themselves um, a software development house. Uh, to translate it from the, uh, from, uh, from the formal English to, to the normal one, I should say these companies are not making products for themselves. They, they develop uh, products for their customers. So they kind of shops to do things for somebody else. And there are a lot of great companies like, for example, Fido System or Syntronics who are working uh, on a local and international market to, uh, to develop um, uh, software and hardware and the combination of software and hardware and even robotics uh, for the different companies. And their clients are very well known. It's a company like Ericsson, Intel, and many others. So like uh, they have really serious uh, clients. And the last area I probably map on this um, presentation, it's um, drone, uh, drones mapping and navigation. There are a bunch of companies who are looking uh, for, uh, for all kinds of, let's say, airport related things and it's not a surprise because uh, the biggest uh, aeronautics provider uh, NAV Canada is located here in Ottawa so these guys are working usually with NAV Canada and with the, um, uh, with their subsidiaries to develop uh, develop solutions by the way uh, so uh, if you're searching for the job, be aware that the large companies like Cisco, Nokia, and Research in Motion, well, now it's called BlackBerry. Sorry, I probably have to change this name. For me, it's forever uh, Research in Motion. So uh, do you have a special rec positions for the new grad? So uh, if, you, uh, if you're looking uh, for the job, you particularly monitor uh, positions for the new grads and for the co-op students for these large companies. So like, even if I know something better than you, I'm in principle cannot get into this role. And it's not a matter of salary, it's a matter of the fact that um, it's specifically designed and reserved for the people who either still at school or graduated from school no more than two years ago. So uh, in some cases, it could be expanded up to three years. So um, here in, at Carleton, we do have a fairly decent uh, career fair department. So check the link I show here. And uh, they also provide you some additional information about what could, uh, or, uh, what could be done and what kind of positions are available for you. Um, so university is always interested to, um, to, include, more pe uh, to include more people in uh, uh, technology. So they will help you to set up the interview and even participate in the first round of the conversation. Uh, well, in, uh, ensure that you have, when you're looking for the job, ensure you have two super important document. One document is a resume or curriculum vitae, if we're speaking Latin. 
And like uh, we're looking for uh, your letter of recommendation. If you already work for somebody or you have a, your project supervisor, uh, you can obtain this reference letter. I would carefully say this way, you will survive without reference letter, but to get, uh, to get job faster and more reliably, it's nice to have a reference letter. Sometimes um, in a paperless era we right now, so there is, <laughs> there is no necessary even to make, uh, to make a paper letter. So like it's more popular in academical world. So maybe you just uh, talk with your supervisor or a course professor and he or she would, pro uh, would agree to do so. So you provide the name, uh, telephone number and email. So like it will definitely help you to go through. Now, uh, the very important thing is, so, and I explain you on the next slide why, uh, keep track where and when you send your resume because your resume uh, will not necessarily be the same all the time. So like be aware what, uh, what kind of version of your resume uh, you send to which organization. Otherwise it would be uh, some sort of unpleasant confusion. So like, it's not a big deal uh, to, to have a list of the companies you're dealing with and what kind of resume you send down there. And it's always obviously nice to uh, say that, look, ladies and gentlemen, so like I'm calling you from the company XYZ and you kind of sort of remember that you actually send the company uh, to company XYZ these, uh, these specific message. So it's nice, it's, it's nice to be aware uh, who is calling you and uh, see like how quickly response is coming from. Uh, where to find the job? Uh, if we had this conversation five or six years ago, it would be a lot of slides and a lot of name, names. Uh, now it's nice and simple. 98 or 99% of the job is published between two sites. One is linkedin.com and the second one indeed.com. To be honest, like I think it's the it is the same database, it's just simply different interfaces to the same database. So like, which means register yourself at LinkedIn and make a reasonable profile down there. The key thing uh, for your profile, it absolutely should have a picture. Uh, not a picture of your dog, not a picture of your cat, not a picture of the Ferrari car. Um, no, just, just regular picture. It, you don't have to put your passport photo. It's, it's not necessarily again in a 21st century, it's too much, but just put a normal photo, uh, smile and uh, look cool. Uh, nice LinkedIn profile. Uh, should, uh, should include all information uh, your client is uh, in, in the future is looking for. So you definitely um, should spend maybe like hour or so uh, to create a simple profile to, because uh, without, without any doubt, um, HR people or your hiring manager will cross reference your resume with your LinkedIn and maybe in, uh, with, a, uh, with, uh, with other social networks. I will not give any advices what to place and not to place in the Facebook and other places, but you probably know that better than me. So uh, person uh, nowadays, people with, uh, with absolutely no uh, social networking history, um, according to what I hear, Usually say, people saying they look suspicious. So like we cannot find him online. Uh, if you send, your, uh, if when you send your resume to different company, uh, be sure that the people uh, most probably will call you over the phone. 
uh, which means I don't understand uh, you have classes, you're busy with something else. So there are some situations you cannot answer the phone. It's not a problem, but you absolutely have to check your voicemail at least twice a day and call back this day in a worst case scenario next day. Otherwise, it simply look not very polite. Oh, it sounds like you already find something so nobody interested to, uh, and you're not interested to, to talk with, um, with this particular company. Okay. Imagine you, uh, you, you find uh, your first job or not the first one. Um, you pass the first interview, uh, which usually called screen interview. So where the people are trying to understand how adequate you are and is it possible to work with you and what kind of obstacles they, they could meet. Obviously uh, nowadays, the key question would be, are you vaccinated? So like, uh, please don't make any jokes about that and uh, give, give the people um, uh, a correct answer. And the reason is very simple. It's a very serious liability issue. And sometimes things, things might be not that funny for the company by itself. So, uh, What kind, of, uh, what kind of company is good for you? To be honest, I cannot tell you uh, by sitting here, oh, this company is good for you or this company is not good for you. Uh, my suggestion sounds like this. Um, for your first job, I would suggest to look for the medium or large size company because these organizations usually have much better uh, structure uh, they, uh, they better organize, uh, you, you will expose to more people, you will, uh, you will expose to more formal trainings, and you will get uh, more uh, reasonable things uh, to get a good start. If you such a serious person and you have a dream to work in a tiny startup company where you know have one or two or three people, uh, it's possible, but a lot of things will be will be uh, solved somehow. And if you will work next year in another startup company, your previous experience would be completely not relevant because everything would be different again. In a in a medium or large size company, the procedure looks the same. So you, if you had your first co-op term, for example, for Cisco. And the next time you're working for Juniper or for Nokia, uh, your experience would be very similar and a lot of things will be repeated and uh, a lot of behavior of the people inside of the office will be much more understandable otherwise. Again, if you're looking for the company, a bigger company would usually have a chance providing more opportunity for you to do different things and to work with the different groups compared to the tiny company, which probably have, have their job, number one, and nothing else. So in this sense, bigger company will produce, uh, will produce a better variety. And for example, you could even work a um, couple of summer term into the same company uh, doing slightly different things. Interview preparation. Usually you have, uh, you will have at least two interviews. First one would be screening interview and it would be a kind of conversation, a light conversation about who you are, what you're doing, what is going on and so on so far. Uh, and most probably it would be no technical details or very little technical details. Nobody will ask, uh, well, the most complicated uh, question will sound, 
oh, do you know how to program in Java or do you know how to program in Python? And nobody will actually check uh, what you uh, what you actually programming because most probably it would be a conversation with the person from HR. And nowadays very often HR job is outsourced too. So these people might be not even the worker of this company. They could work for the different organization. If you pass the first, inter, uh, first uh, screening interview, you will be destined to, um, to the second and uh, for the tedious companies like Cisco for the third one. Second and third, third interview will be most probably either in person or over the Zoom or Google Hangout. And it will, uh, it will include more detailed conversation with the multiple people, some sort of assignment uh, to be solved and so on so far. So um, what is important is to, to be prepared. Uh, the first thing uh, and obvious step is to learn about your potential client. Uh, so what this company is doing how big it is uh, and other things. Because like uh, I will mention one company later on um, in avionics and, uh, and my boss always ask a question, uh, why you decided to work with avionics? And some people even did not know that we work in avionics because the company had a kind of fairly strange name. So there was no avionics there whatsoever. So check the company web, uh, website, check the company review at, at the website, which, which called glassdoors.com and just browse what people uh, saying, looking uh, uh, about, uh, about this organization. It, it's, uh, it would be important information uh, what, what this company is and what they're doing and what uh, they want to do and so on and so far. Uh, be prepared to answer a simple question. Why, why do you want to work uh, for us? Uh, what do you know about us? Uh, well, you don't, uh, you don't have to learn by heart the name of all executives, especially if it's foreign uh, first and last name, it's hard to pronounce them. So like it's not necessarily, but you should demonstrate your interest and your willingness to learn more about the specific company, culture, uh, area of activity, and so on so far. So if the interview happened uh, on offline in person, so uh, usually it would be uh, two, uh, two people in the room at the, sa uh, at the same time. So uh, try to remember their name, uh, keep the eye contact and try to uh, interact with those people uh, using their names. Well, usually um, for the company like Cisco or Juniper, it would be two and two. So two people and then two other people. So uh, try to remember people and try to, um, try to maintain nice and friendly things again. Uh, sense of humor is amazing thing. Uh, some high tech people uh, have a very good sense of humor, some not. So before you're making jokes, uh, think twice. And, and especially if it's your uh, interview, uh, keep your jokes for later, okay? Uh, you can make any uh, writings on the interview. So like if you bring the, small notebook and pen or paper so you could write things especially if uh, people recommend you to learn about something or to be more familiar with something else uh, if the interview happens in the zoom well still well the name of the people usually written in a, in a corner of the Zoom screen. Uh, but at the same time, at the same time, I would say uh, it's still nice to maintain the eye contact and talk to the people and always respect the fact that uh, the conference system 
will mute people if they keep in the long pose. So like, listen carefully who is talking to you because you might think, and it's very common conclusion. So you might think you're talking with one person, but it's actually another one. So taking notes is fine, except the situation when the company is asking you explicitly not to take any notes. Um, I had this experience, uh, especially with the financial companies because this is their policy, so. Okay, uh, what kind of skills could be useful? Um, don't expect uh, that uh, even if you take an advanced math or advanced engineering, people will ask you um, very complicated mathematical questions. So uh, most questions would be in a kind of high school level of the problem solving and quick estimation. So uh, don't try to make a super complicated calculations. So um, one of these kind of high tech example, um, uh, well known from the interview with the Amazon is the following. So they asking you, uh, there is a, chain which is stretched between two poles and the distance uh, this uh, distance between poles needs to be found the height of the pole is for example I don't know 40 meters so the question uh, would be what is the distance between poles if the lowest part of the chain is hanging on a height of the 10 meters and uh, I think this, uh, this problem reviewed multiple times uh, on the YouTube. Uh, basically speaking, there is, a, there is a hard way to solve this problem by, uh, by running the equation of the, uh, of the chain lane and uh, to, uh, to try to calculate. But if you just draw this picture, you figure out so the distance between two poles is actually zero because the only way uh, that uh, that this chain uh, would be able to hang this way if the poles are basically coming one to another. And even if you're trying to uh, mathematically correct way uh, to solve this problem with hyperbolic uh, sine, uh, sine and cosine, um, well, <laughs> you will get equation which doesn't have any roots. So, so as well as uh, as well as quick estimation, how long the certain things uh, will work. So, what's nice to know, I would say it's a linear algebra. All kind of things related uh, to system of linear equations or and related stuff. Algorithms with a graph, uh, simple numerical algorithm, for example, the algorithm how to solve the simple equation. For example, uh, the question might be, I have equation, I don't know, sinus x equal x divided by two. How you will uh, solve this equation uh, to find the root using the computer program. Well, you don't have to make a super complicated um, method, but something as simple as division uh, the interval by two and finding the right root will work for you. Uh, basic statistics algorithm uh, would be nice. For example, um, everybody know how to find um, how to find the average, but very often people asking, how can I make a recurrent algorithm to calculate average? So the numbers all the time coming to me one by one, and I should display constantly average. So, well, you can use the, the kind of um, textbook formula, but in this case, it's better to use a recurrent formula where the new, the new average is calculated as a previous one uh, multiplied by uh, the new number with a particular weight. So, uh, Monte Carlo, it's a little bit, uh, uh, it's little bit uh, too serious to say. I would say people might be interested in how to generate a simple distribution 
for uh, normal or exponential um, uh, random values, for example. So like if you know that it's cool, if not, just, um, just take it easy. And general knowledge about encryption uh, algorithms and procedures, you don't have to be an expert in this area, but at the same time, be aware about what is going on and we'll have an adequate conversation. Nobody will ask you to invent the new unbreakable um, encryption algorithm, but if you know at least one um, chipping method. So like it would be nice to, uh, to show this information to, to the people. Um, essential software skills. Uh, I put some random things in. So like uh, see what you could do. So like on the top, I put math lab because like all math students supposed to know that. You, if you're familiar with a uh, with a statistical package called SAS, so it's nice. From the programming language point of view, it could be Python, or if you're going to the more kind of embedded company, um, C or C plus plus would be nice. Basically, the combination of C plus plus and Python will cover, um, I would say, about ninety percent of the market for you. Linux. Nice to know, and most people are familiar with the Linux. Um, so like in some companies, it's fancy to, to even use uh, the working desktop in the Linux. So be familiar if you never ever deal with the Linux, uh, take a simple Linux like Ubuntu, for example, and see how it works and how to work, uh, how to use it. Um, it's basically not much different than, um, than Windows or Mac OS. Ah, by the way, Mac OS is a Linux, is a Linux too. It's called FreeBSD. So it's a, it's, a, it's a fancy environment, but if you open, in on on your Mac a black window a black command window you will get access to the same Linux like everything else all the Linux command could be executed uh, from down there. Again, ninety nine percent of the uh, network communication is done over IP networks. Well, it it's nice to understand uh, the difference, for example, between TCP and UDP. And uh, at least be familiar with the, some acronyms. Um, it's uh, at the very end. It's nice to uh, to uh, to understand the idea of the real time, and what is real time is different from the non real time. Uh, what is the artificial intelligence and so on so far. Uh, and I especially start to put some acronyms at the end of this slide because. The nature of the things is as such that in a high tech company, they're very often speaking but on the language of the acronym. So don't afraid if you hear something, uh, something like RTI DDS uh, or TCP IP or something else you never heard uh, in your life. It's nice if you know what it is, but it's okay to ask. And it's okay to actually uh, demonstrate your degree of interest and say, excuse me, sir or ma'am, uh, like, I'm not sure what this means, please explain. And the nice people often, uh, uh, mo uh, most definitely do that. So uh, again, if you, uh, if you face some uh, more than two acronyms, use your notebook and pen. Uh, to write them down. It might help you to, to continue this interview without hitches because, well, you know, you might forget what these, uh, these uh, acronymical things uh, actually means. Um, when we prepare this presentation, uh, Professor Bilek asked me to include a uh, couple of examples of the project I was working with. So like um, I choose two, uh, which looks a little bit uh, scientific or maybe not. 
So let's uh, let's review them quickly. Uh, one company, um, it's an international company. They used to have office in Toronto. I think they don't have office in Toronto anymore. So the company called Smith Detection. This company is a major producer of all kinds of equipment you face uh, in the airport. It's an x-ray machine, it's a bomb and narcotics detectors. And if you ever been at uh, CN Tower in Toronto, before you, you are able to go to the, uh, to the elevator, you're going through the such an arch, which is puffing the high pressure air on you. It's also, um, it's not a cleaning system, it's actually a bomb and narcotics detector done by uh, Smith Detection, actually by me. Um, or in the airport, you see this nice device, uh, which is present in the fort, uh, at the photo on the bottom of the page. It's, co it's called IOSCAN uh, 500T. It has, a it has a multiple siblings, some of them as small as a tiny vacuum cleaner, or some of them as large as, as a kind of arch in a building, which often used either in, a, in some airport, in jails, in a high security buildings. All these devices are employing the method which called ion mobile spectroscopy. These, these ion mobile spectroscopy or IMS to be short, so now well, another acronym is a, is a simple physical principles. So if you split, um, if you split chemical substance on a different ions, so uh, by, uh, by pushing these ions in a, a strong magnetic fields, so the charged ions start to move in a different direction. And the radius of the turn of these ions is proportional to the ratio between uh, mass and charge, because the actual force which is making, mm, making this ion to move, uh, move on the arch is a uh, Coulomb force. So, uh, so like, and, uh, to calculate the centrific equation, uh, it's the centrific acceleration and equation you will get obviously, uh, obviously the mass. And um, as we learn, first of all, in the scientific laboratories and then already in the, uh, in the industry that the mass to charge ratio is a very good indicator um, for, uh, for the different ions. So we can easily identify um, narcotics or a minute quantity of explosive uh, by, uh, by analyzing uh, these substance by mass to charge ratio. So what's cool about that is this machine will never fail. Well, it could make a false alarm. So for example, uh, for example, in a test, if you wash your hand, uh, if you wash your hands and then use a heavy cream based on the glycerin, well, uh, you will be definitely uh, alerted by this machine because there is no big difference for this machine between glycerin in a, in a hand cream and the nitroglycerin as explosive. But at least if uh, people, uh, if the secondary examination will show that you're nice and clean, um, uh, you will not have any problem. Otherwise, this uh, machine is extremely good to, uh, to detect, uh, to detect uh, really minute uh, quantity of uh, dangerous substance. And we had a very good record of, uh, of catching uh, bad people uh, or unsuspected people who use as a mule to, to care uh, these substances in, a, in the airport and other public places.
so um so okay uh so and um, and then this way and the second company uh, i would like uh, i would like you to talk about uh working in the area of aviation it's called Searage Technologies. And I, I mentioned this company because it's a little bit hard to imagine that this company is working in the area of avionics. Uh, because Searage basically means a kind of, well, the idea was, well, I'm partially responsible for this company name. So like, let's say we try to say, it's a, like a, a lighthouse in a, in a sea which is showing the light, uh, showing the direction uh, to, uh, to the ships in a bad weather. But let's, uh, let's live with that. Oh, and I have a mixed slide. I probably should change the order of the slide, my fault. Okay, so like this is the IMS, uh, IMS detection. So basically uh, when, we, uh, when we inhale uh, the mix of the ion from IMS, uh, from IMS device, we actually we actually uh, detect uh, the 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 distribution of the ions with a uh, with a different ratio between uh, weight uh, charge and weight, and the output of this diagram look kind of sort of like this. We have a multiple peaks uh, to, um, which are related uh, to the certain materials. Obviously then uh, this, uh, this stuff is going through the computer database where things carefully analyzed and we're trying to make a decision what kind of uh, material it could be. It actually could be material that nobody uh, knows, but usually we have a database about a 4,000 substance, which is good enough to, uh, to get everything. So what kind of mathematics are we using inside of this project? So, uh, so statistical analysis, because uh, obviously the measurements uh, has a certain element of the error. And especially if we man, uh, measure the very minute quality of, uh, of the substance, it could be some fluctuation. So we very carefully measure the result. And then we're filtrating the data up to the point we can actually, uh, we can actually identify the material. And the last step, uh, stop is uh, to actually run things through. Uh, the database as fast as possible, because if you have a lane of passengers and like uh, it takes 10 minutes to detect each and every passenger, air airport will be not a happy customers for us. So like we implement a very special uh, database search algorithms to actually find uh, things as quick as possible. And usually uh, we run the kind of preliminary search to be sure that uh, the substance is not in a super dangerous list and we're going to the substance in a less dangerous list and then we're going to the list of the general substance. And well, here I put, uh, I put a very kind of basic um, computer programming example. So basically you don't have to, uh, to place things. For example, if you check the value is equal to zero, uh, it's better not to check either it's equal to zero, but to present it in a form of uh, modulus X less than a certain small value. Well, let's go back to, uh, to, to the Searage. So Searage uh, was created as a company uh, which is doing completely different things. So like Searage Technologies offer uh, at the beginning, how to replace a radar inside of the airport by array of video cameras. The reason why we're doing so, because when, uh, 
when, uh, especially in Europe, when city coming too close to the airport, we cannot use radar uh, very close to the ground, which basically means for the last 150 meters uh, of the sand, uh, the airplane is not controlled by the radar anymore. So and it's nice to have alternative way to do so. And um, about nine years ago, Sirich Technologies offer an excellent solution to use an array of um, video cameras to, to track the airplane and to estimate all required characteristics and to create basically a huge help for the air traffic controllers. It's extremely stressful job. Uh, it's... Um, it's one of the few jobs where the shift is, uh, is lasted between four and six hours. And trust me, it is, uh, it is still a torture for those people. So uh, it's a very intensive job. For example, in a Heathrow airport in uh, United Kingdom, uh, each, uh, each three seconds airplane either take off or land. And there are only four crew of the air traffic controllers, which are handling all this traffic. So obviously everything should be nice and clear for those people. And uh, the control tower is very often doesn't provide the excellent vision for this stuff. So what I would say, um, so uh, the sewage technology solution was, uh, was designed to to create what we call a virtual window. Virtual window basically means the array of uh, video cameras create an excellent view on the most critical area. And these areas are overlapped with a, a specific uh, information about what is going on. This is actually a real, uh, real screenshot from our testing, as you could see, uh, this wall behind is a truly, um, a truly set of the display panels, which looks like an actual window. This, this kind of virtual window could be up to, well, I would say almost 300 degrees um, surrounding. So like it, it looks like you're sitting like inside of the kind of uh, glass dome and you're looking for everything around. What is cool about that, that compared to the, to a standard window, in addition to the picture, we have a lot of what we call metadata. So, so when the airplane is landing, we have all necessary information about the idea of this airplane, uh, speed and all other required information. And uh, based on the landing trajectory, uh, the system immediately uh, helps to make a decision either everything is going right or everything is going not quite right. For example, if uh, by mistake, some unsuspected vehicle is, um, uh, will be located on the runway, the system will automatically generate um, an alarm. And that's, uh, that's how those things uh, will, uh, will, uh, will indicate that the, uh, in this emergency situation, the airplane either should be diverted or this vehicle uh, needs to be immediately removed from the path of airplane. So uh, over the seven years, this system is used in a, Ottawa Airport, we have a fairly good track record in a sometimes very heavy weather, uh, which might, uh, might be in Ottawa uh, during the winter time. So uh, the cool thing is that in addition to visual cameras, so like this system also incorporate infrared cameras, so which provide the excellent view. Uh, even with the... Uh, uh, even at night, even in a um, uh, heavy snowfall. So like this picture is not as beautiful as you see here, it's black and white, 
but actually you could see absolutely everything and uh, distinguish between uh, movable object and non-movable object, and especially if, uh, if uh, airport is busy to clean up the runway, you could see all the snow, uh, snow removal equipment moving back and forth. Nowadays, uh, series technology move far forward. So we, uh, we create what's called, uh, uh, from, we move from the virtual window to the virtual tower, which basically means you could now land airport uh, when, the, uh, when there was no tra uh, air traffic controller uh, on site. So for now, we have a, a successfully um, working the facility in, uh, in Montreal. So, uh, which, is, uh, which is actually helping to uh, land and take off airplanes uh, on the far north. So like uh, air traffic controllers remotely log in into the remote airport using the high uh, speed satellite links, check the weather condition, uh, runway condition, and many, many other things and help the pilot to land or set up the warning that the airport, uh, this uh, tiny airport is not in the best possible condition for landing and offering them alternative route and an alternative landing spot if the weather is really bad. The system uh, heavily using a mathematical algorithm and artificial intelligence to recognize between different type of um, different type of object in the sky and on the ground, and uh, to estimate how close they actually are and there is any dangers for this um, for the of, of the potential collision or not. So uh, virtual tower is now official term, and there is even virtual tower alliance. So it's a set of the towers, which could be, uh, which includes multiple video cameras, uh, other sensors uh, to, uh, to actually maintain the normal airport work when the, uh, when the main tower, uh, for whatever reason, is uh, dysfunctional or partially dysfunctional. It could be any security event, it could be any weather event, it could be any natural disaster like a, like a fire, for example. So like it, uh, it is a very good way to make our airports extremely safe. So uh, the map between these, um, uh, these uh, project, well, including a lot of common filtration to make a smooth tracking uh, for, for the objects and predict their position because sometimes the object might disappear uh, behind another object, uh, but we still are able to, uh, to track it. A lot of image processing. In the first place, it's, it's a Poisson blending and barrel distortion. The barrel distortion is very simple. If you ever use a, a strong binocular, you know that um, uh, that picture is kind of uh, look a little bit uh, like, a, like a circular or what's called barrel, uh, barrel distorted. So like uh, all the video cameras uh, we're using because they have very powerful zoom and, the, and they could watch uh, for the uh, section on the runway, which is almost a mile uh, from the main tower, so like using very powerful optics. So in order to, uh, to return this picture to, uh, to the nice and normal window look, we have uh, undo barrel distortion and blend the color accordingly because you know the air is not 100% uh, transparent. So like if you're looking to, to an object far, far away, so the far mountains looking a little bit foggy and a little bit funny in the colors. So like it all should be, uh, should be uh, adjusted uh, to, to get a standard look. 
You could also uh, consider the fact that all cameras are slightly different. So the same, uh, the same object uh, will have a slightly different color on a different cameras. So we were using the procedure which called color blending. So to set up um, maybe not 100% real, but 100% average colors. So to make, uh, so when the object move from camera to ca camera, it doesn't change the color. Well, video cameras are notorious for making mistakes uh, in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in a distance coordinate. So like, it's very easy to understand who is on the left, who is on the right, who is up, who is down. But sometimes it's, um, uh, it is, uh, it is, uh, it is harder to understand the depth. So using procedure uh, known as a calibration together with the artificial intelligence, we able make a, a fairly good estimate uh, uh, how to calculate the depth of this, uh, of this scene. So, uh, and we're obviously working hard with the linear algebra to make a coordinate transformation to bring all the sensor data uh, to the single uh, to the single Cartesian uh, three-dimensional coordinate system to actually uh, put them all together. So because usually uh, usually all sensors have a very different way of uh, mapping the position of the object. Machine learning helping us to recognize between different type of the object. And especially if the objects are blending together, for example, two aircraft overlap one to another. Um, it's a fairly complicated view, and that's why, why we're using uh, those things to, uh, to actually uh, separate that. And machine learning is doing much, much better than any, any algorithms we used before, because it was always a problem. Well, it's been um, an interesting evening. So thank you, Alexei, and thank you everybody for participating.